Hello, my name is Dr. Linda Lynch. I'm an osteoarchaeologist and I'm going to be showing you today a general introduction to osteoarchaeology and with reference to forensic anthropology. And we're going to be going through in detail osteological profiling. In particular, this relates to how we determine the age of death and the sex of an individual, of a skeletonized individual. Um, and as I said, the, the start will be an introduction. It will be a follow on to field techniques that um, uh, have already been covered to a certain degree. And I'm, this is particularly relating to lab techniques, but these evolve from what we have already done on site. It all relates uh, back to what, how we excavate skeletons, how we record them. So excavating skeletons obviously is a very scientific discipline. It needs to be undertaken rigorously. Um, and just to show you some of the, the tools that we use, and you, you'll be familiar hopefully with some of these, this is obviously a trowel, an ordinary three, um, three, three inch pointing trowel, which is standard for uncovering burials, for identifying edges of burials, um, and a, excavating around some of the larger bones of, of the human skeleton. Um, when we get closer to the bone, smaller, smaller tools are required. So I would typically use this, and you can see the, the blade on that being very, very small, as you can see, and it's actually blunted. Now, obviously, somebody starting out might, would be recommended to use either a wooden or a plastic tool to minimize any damage to, to, to bone. You obviously don't want to be using metal against bone. So it's being a, ver a very careful uh, excavation procedure. What we would also use extensively is a brush, uh, particularly depending on the soil conditions, because it's not always possible to brush off the debris um, if the soils are particularly clay, because that can just spread soil against the bone. Um, so, but this is particularly useful in sandy conditions where sand can literally be brushed off and you may have no use, need for metal tools. Um, a lot of people do use something like this, which is a leaf trowel. Personally, I find them unhelpful because they're literally too flexible. So that if you're working near, as, and an example of this is the hand, you can see all the different bones that are in a single hand. And very rarely will you get a burial where the hand is lying out like that. It will generally be with fingers curled in. So one flick of something like this can dislodge a number of bones. So because of the flexibility of this, it's not, not the best tool to be using, at least around uh, bones like that. Uh, we've, you should have gone through, hopefully in detail, of how we record them. And particularly, I'm referring here to how we would bag up a skeleton. You can see, for example, how this individual is laid out and what, is, what is, might be difficult for some people to understand is what we talk about when we talk about the right and left side of the skeleton. It is not the left and right side of the excavator, it is the left and right side of the skeleton. So these are the right side bones of this individual and these are the left side bones. And all of these elements, when the skeleton is completely uncovered and photographed and recorded, all these elements would be bagged separately. For example, the left leg would be separate, the left foot, the left hand, the left arm. So that's four separate bags, at least for those four elements. And this is maintained throughout the, ex uh, tr through the excavation, obviously, but also in the post-excavation um, uh, analysis and uh, because there's processing of the skeleton afterwards. Um, what I've shown, what I want to show here as well is some animal bone. Um, and it's obviously, it's, it's a learned technique. You're not going to, you know, be able to immediately identify animal from human bone. Um, a lot of it, if bones are complete, and particularly if they're of larger mammals, like cattle or horse, the sheer size and density and weight of the bone will immediately indicate to even an amateur that they are not human in origin. But when it gets to fragmentary sizes such as this, 
Um, sometimes it, the, it is the nature of the bone itself that is most obvious. And if you take this fragment here, you will see that there's some what we call post-mortem damage to the bone and there has been flaking of the bone layers. You don't generally get these very distinct layers in human bone and as well the, the, the bone would be a lot denser in animals in general. They'd, as I said they'd be stronger and more robust generally and then these are the very obvious indicators of animals, very large teeth that you would get in, in the larger mammals in particular. Um, so, it, and it's, you need to be able to separate out animal bone from human bone because it's ethically wrong to have animal bone bagged or faunal remains as such bagged with human remains. So human remains should be always just kept separate. So when you have the skeleton completely excavated and uh, bagged up, then it is taken into a lab where it is processed, post-excavation processing. And this generally involves washing with a tap water and allowing to dry at room temperature. But it's very careful washing and it's using literally toothbrush, something soft, that the bristle is soft, it's not damaging the bone. The bones of this individual are generally very well preserved, so this you know, could be washed in, in that manner. Sometimes, depending on the site conditions, the bones can be very poorly preserved and washing even with something like this can cause more damage. So it depends. Sometimes it might be best to leave bones dry without washing them and then dry brushing them. Um, it, it entirely depends on the site itself and the context of the, of the burial and what is, what is best for the preservation of the remains. So I'm just going to, to move these perhaps out of the way and we'll talk a little bit more about once the skeleton has been washed and dried and rebagged into clean bags um, all relabeled again with the, with the same information. Again it's very very important that each of the bags has the site name, the site number, the skeleton number and the skeletal element as well as the date excavated and the initials of the excavator. So all of the, that information is, is crucial um, in terms of, of the, the bagging of the skeleton. So when we get the skeleton then into the lab for the actual um, osteoarchaeological analysis, we lay it out in what's termed anatomical position. Now this, we would already have all of the records from the excavation. So this would include the skeleton recording sheet, any relevant information in terms of the burial itself, for example, if it was a coffin burial, or you know, if there was other important information, as well as photographs of the burial in situ being excavated. Uh, so we would have all that information, but then we would lay out a skeleton um, in what's termed anatomical position. Firstly, the conditions of the, of the lab need to be correct. You need to have a large table that can accommodate the remains of an individual, of an adult individual. We would never lay out the remains of two individuals at the same time uh, because the chances of, of bones being mixed up is, is significant then at that, at that stage. Um, and you need to have proper lighting. You need to be able to see all of the bones properly. Um, so we would start Again, obviously keeping lefts and rights of the skeleton itself, and it is laid out as, uh, as if lying on the back with the arms stretched out like this, so palm upright. So if we take a look at the skeleton, the model skeleton here, you can see that the right hand, when it is extended, this is palm up, these two bones are straight down, okay? So like this. Whereas if the arm is turned with the palm facing back, these two bones cross. And so that's not anatomically correct in terms of laying out the skeleton. So it should always, the, the, this part of the arm and the hand always need to be laid like this, laid flat. Um, and th because 
it's all about once you've th it, this laid out, if there's pathological lesions, if there's other factors that need to be identified on the remains, you have to describe exactly what bone is impacted and where on the bone it is. And I've made reference in, in a presentation to how we describe those lesions or how we describe where on the bones they are. For example, if you take uh, this bone, the humerus, from this part of the arm, you would need, if there was something particularly, a, a pathological lesion or an injury or something on this bone, in the written description of it later on, you need to describe whether it, whether it is on the proximal end here, or the distal end, is it on the, the, the front, which is the anterior of the bone, or the back, which is the posterior. Um, details like this need to be recorded. So having the bone laid out in anatomical position assists in this greatly. Um, as I said, you need good light to be able to see the bones properly and enough space to be able to access all the remains at the same time. And as the individual is being laid out, every single bone is looked at in detail. So literally even this bone, which is from this part of your hand, from the outer part of the palm of your hand, it's a metacarpal, the fifth metacarpal. When this is being laid out, we literally examine it in detail to see, first of all, is it normal or is there something unusual about it? Um, very often, you'll, there'll be small anomalies that will show up on bones that pinpoint there may be something wrong. Um, and we, we'll be talking in another presentation about disease. Um, but very often, you will get very, very tiny traces of something like a sharp weapon that has been used on an individual. And it may have nicked the bone, but it could literally, the cut might only be millimetres long. Um, so all of the bones are examined in detail to, to assess those details. Um, so we're going to move on now to looking at osteological profiling in particular. And th so this is looking at the age at death of individuals, how we determine that, and how we determine the sex of individuals. We're going to start with juvenile remains. And so I'll be speaking a little bit about why, how juvenile remains are very different in terms of what you're seeing here of a mature adult. And from that, how, will we, how we determine the age of death of juveniles and then moving back to adult individuals looking at age of death and sex. So now we're going to talk about how we determine the age at death in juvenile individuals. And so contradicting so somewhat what I said earlier about not laying two individuals out on one table, for the purposes of this demonstration, there are, but we've them visibly laid in different orientations. So there's a young infant on one side of the table. And as you can see, the main part of the table is taken up by an older uh, juvenile individual. Um, I, I know from some publications that the term sub-adult is used a lot for individuals who are not adults. I don't use that term, it's, it's, but it's certainly considered somewhat derogatory in some um, publications and the term juvenile individual is, is preferred when we're talking about um, individuals such as this. So just, just before we go into detail on the methods that we would use to determine the age of death of juveniles, um, I just want you again to look at the, the, the skeletons of these individuals and comparing to the adult that we had uh, earlier on display. Um, you, you should note obviously that the bones overall are, are small, but if you even look here at the infant individual, you'll see that in comparison to the spine that we had in the adult individual, you'll see the spine here is composed of multiple elements. Um, I mentioned earlier that a skeleton needs to be laid out in the lab, lab in an anatomical position. I f forgot to mention the fact that you, can't, you don't lay the spine out in anatomical position. You don't lay it out in an articulated state. It needs to be laid out in the manner that you can actually see the individual elements, and that's why you have the neck vertebra here, we have the thoracic vertebra, which form the rib cage on either side, 
and this is the part of the lower spine. And so it, it's all laid out in such a way that you can actually see the individual bones. Um, and whereas, again, it's, it's the older individual is laid out in a similar manner, but you can see here the spine is, is in a different um, uh, level of development in comparison to the other individual. These are two very well preserved individuals, as you can see. Um, and just one thing I'd like to point out, um, and because obviously we're looking at the skeletal remains in terms of profiling, like we discussed earlier, or what this session is about, but you're also recording the pa any pathological lesions and things like that, but there's also other factors that you're recording things like this. And this individual has numerous instances of this green staining that you can see on the bone. So this is the top of the breastbone, the manubrium, and you'll see there's a very strong green stain on that bone. You'll see it as well on the first metacarpal of the right hand, which forms the base of your thumb. And it's also in some of the vertebrae. You'll see it very clearly there. So that would be the back of the spine. And these are indications that there's some copper alloy objects in, within the grave, whether they comprise something that was buried with the individual or whether it's something that was already in the ground, you know, may be determined from the excavation itself. Um, the other aspect, we obviously, there's other elements of this course that has gone into detail on how you excavate a skeleton, but perhaps something that I should mention here as well in terms of um, <clears throat> the excavation of the remains is that when you're excavating the spine, an important factor to consider is the placement of the spine. So if you look at this, this is part of the lower spine, okay? And the, if somebody is buried on their back, which is normal, this is how that vertebra would appear in the soil, with this being the base of the grave. So you can see how much of the bone actually needs to be uncovered before you ever lift it. And that's what we've, uh, we have been speaking about in terms of other elements of the excavation that you never prize bones out. You have to be very, very careful in the excavation and exposing as much of the remains as possible because you need to be able to remove bones intact as much as possible to get as much information as you can. Now, the whole basis of determining the age of death in juveniles is more accurate than in adult individuals. And I'll, I'll be explaining the adult um, age of death methodologies later on. Um, the reason they're, they're, they are more accurate for juveniles is because humans generally grow at a known rate. Your, your teeth uh, form and develop and erupt at a known rate These, the, and has been established from you know, multiple studies over many decades. Um, the skeleton itself, the skeleton structure as well, uh, develops, matures at a known rate. Um, the other presentations I've detailed how we determine the age of death from juveniles and in particular it's to do with dental development, it's to do with long bone growth and to do with maturation and fusion of bones. So if we look at the infant here in particular, um, you'll see firstly if you consider the, the remains of the, the skull itself and the cranium, you'll see it's in different sections, in different plates. This is the back of the skull. You can see it's actually in four different portions. These are the sides of the skull, the left and the right side. And this is the left and the right side of, of the forehead that actually develops in two separate halves. The mandible itself is in two halves as well. And then if you look at the spine, as I said, it's laid out in exactly the same way for adults and juveniles. But here, if you consider a single vertebrae down here, you'll see it's in three different parts. You have the body and the arches. So just for comparison, this is it in the older individual and it's in a single piece. So a, a newborn, in, in the newborn individual, in the, in the young infant, a vertebrae, for example, is in three different parts. And as that individual gets older, these will fuse together. And they fuse, these bones fuse together at a known rate. So that's how we can establish the age of death 
it, it, for, for some individuals. Um, if you look at long bones, in, in particular, there's technically an infant doesn't have um, joint surfaces because the joints just comprise cartilage. And later on, as we'll see, that the joint surfaces will develop and they'll fuse on and we use that. Uh, that's another later method, uh, method of determining age of death in, in older individuals. Um, if we look at the dental remains of this individual, and I'll just hold some of the teeth up to the camera to show the size of these. And they're the crowns of the teeth of uh, the full-term infant that are still in development. Now you can appreciate the size of those as they are. They'll quite often fall out of the, the mandible or the maxilla during excavation. So that's why it can be very important to sieve remains, to sieve, when you're excavating, to sieve the soil around the skull. Um, if you look at the hands and the bones of the feet as well, they're very, very small. And again, sieving should certainly be considered for very young individuals and should also be considered for older individuals, right up to including adults, um, for dental remains and also for smaller bones. <clears throat> that can appear in the, the hands and the feet. Um, when you're talking about an individual that is this young, the actual best method to determine the age of death is from long bones. There's been a lot of forensic studies undertaken as to how um, the correlation between the lengths of the long bones and the, fetal, the age of the individual in fetal months. So we would generally take looking, we would look at the lengths of the long bones, that, that tends to be the most accurate. Obviously, you need to consider the fact that the, the data that might be used might not necessarily translate back to a population that perhaps lived a thousand years ago, but it certainly can, can provide very useful information. Um, the teeth are not as reliable for very, very young infants like this because they're so tiny and so fragile that they sometimes break. You're not also always going to be able to recover all of them. So again, the, the, they're not used as much to determine the age of death in very young infants. So moving on to the older individual, and this is the remains of an individual that's approximately eight to 10 years of age. Um, again, in a presentation of where I, I talk about looking at the age of death of juveniles, I reference that the fact that long bones can be used to determine the age of death as well of older individuals. The problem with that for an older juvenile is that nutritional deficiencies really start to impact the growth rate of an individual. So if somebody is suffering from uh, nutritional deficiencies in early childhood, it can impact their growth rate, which can obviously impact the lengths of the long bones. So it, and the methods that tend to be used a lot are based on measurements that were taken on individuals that lived in 20th century America. Again, how they're applicable to earlier populations is obviously a, you know, a major consideration. But there are ways of establishing, um, if you have a large enough skeletal population, there are ways of establishing um, patterns or reference samples of long bone growth from a population where the age of death has been established from dental remains, for example, because it's the dental remains that are the most reliable indicators of age of death in, in juveniles such as, as this. And that is because obviously the te teeth again um, develop and grow and erupt at a known rate. So at about the age of six and seven years of age, an individual starts losing their deciduous teeth and the permanent teeth start coming up. But even before that, obviously, we've seen already in the full-term infant, there are already the crowns of teeth in that individual. So right the way th from before birth, from in utero, right up until when your third permanent molar erupts, if it erupts, there are teeth developing and growing all the way through those stages. Um, the teeth are reliable indicators right up until... Um, early adolescence really and after that you know you we can't really depend on the third molar as being an, an indicator of when somebody died because it's 
it's not present in everybody. The other thing to note of with an individual of this age, which would be considered an older juvenile as such, is the development of the joint surfaces itself. We've already looked at the infant and I've said that they don't have bony joint surfaces, the joint surfaces are just cartilage. But at this stage, at the, you know, uh, eight to 10 years of age, the joint surfaces are now well developed. So if you take, for example, this is your part of the right arm. Um, if you look at the surface here, it's quite roughened and what we'd call youthful as such. And you'll see this mimicked later on when we talk about um, looking at age at death in adults as well to do with different joint surfaces. But looking at it here, this is the actual joint surface itself that has developed as a t from a tiny nodule of bone in very early childhood and has developed into the actual joint itself. So that it will, fi it fits onto the bone like that and eventually, in adolescence, this will fuse on. This separation of the joint surface from the long bone itself allows the bone to grow. But a long bone, for example, grows in, in two planes as such. It obviously grows outwards, but it grows in length in particular. And having the joint separate from the bone allows that long, longitudinal growth. These joint surfaces will fuse onto the long bones in adolescence, as I said, and in, they will fuse earlier in females than in males and in individuals. Um, you will see further down, for example, if you look at the, the femur, the thigh bone here, the right thigh bone, you'll see again, this is the, the joint surface of what's called the ball and socket joint, the very rounded, very similar to the, the bone we just saw, the joint surface we saw. And again, you know, the requirement to be very familiar with how they look and how you distinguish the two bones. And that's literally a matter of, of practice. But you'll see again, the very billowed surfaces of unfused juvenile bones. And this is the, the, the end of the femur. These can be somewhat confusing to early stage osteoarchaeologists if there's uh, animal remains in the assemblage, um, particularly of animals that have been butchered quite young because the joint surfaces aren't fused on and can resemble uh, human remains to a certain degree. Um, but it's all about getting used to, to looking at the, and the morphology of bones and being able to identify them. Um, if you'll note, again, the spine, as I said, each individual element of the spine will fuse to form a single vertebra such as this and we'll see how this further develops in adolescence and on into adulthood where, where like everything it, it matures and stops growing um, and this is the sacrum which is a triangular bone at the base of the spine again it's useful uh, to determine late stage um, development in an individual it's one of the last bones in the body to fuse to to to, to mature as such um, so we're going to move on and just look at a few different aspects of the de determining the age of death of an adolescent individual some of the late stages of what we call epiphyseal fusion or joint fusion um, secondary fusion of the joints so we'll move on to this now so now we're going to move on to the eldest of the juvenile categories, the adolescents. And I've only laid out a certain uh, selection of bones to, to show what we would use to determine the age of death at this stage of, of human development as such. Um, you'll see the, the adult individual in a while and the, how mature the bones are. Everything has stopped growing in comparison to the younger individuals that we saw earlier. This is the in-between stage as such. So if we look, for example, at this bone, which is the right humerus of the arm, and we spoke earlier about how the joints form in early childhood as individual pieces of bone, and then eventually fuse on in adolescence. And this is the case here, where you'll see the joint is completely, norm, is completely fused and mature at this end of the bone. 
but at the other end, as we showed earlier, you could see the joint surfaces, it hasn't fused on yet, but it has retained that billowing youthful type surface. Now, there, I have put together a reading list, but you'll see there's very standard texts used as to how age of death is determined by the level, the, the degree of fusion. Um, and that's, that's what's used at this stage, because again, the, the, the lengths of long bones aren't reliable in a, an individual of this age, and the, the dental uh, remains are mature as such, so they're not, they're not very useful either. You can see again, this, this is the radius and the ulna of the lower part of the arm, and this joint surface is completely fused and mature, whereas they're unfused down here. Um, if you look at, this is a single uh, skeletal element of the hand laid out, so stretching from, from this part of the palm up into the fingers. And what you'll see here is, again, the joint surfaces are, aren't yet fused on. Um, and this, it, they will fuse on, again, by about 15 years of age in general. Um, but this highlights, again, the need to be really careful, as we said earlier, about being able to recover all the skeletal elements during the excavation and the need to, to sieve these elements, particularly in younger individuals. Um, I mentioned earlier that uh, males and females, the, the joint surfaces fuse at different rates in males and females, and that girls will generally, uh, the joint surfaces will fuse on earlier in adolescence, whereas boys are later um, in terms of skeletal maturation, and that's why boys in general will grow for a longer period of time. And despite the fact that we can't, you know, at, at this, sorry, at this stage in adolescence, it is generally possible to determine whether somebody is a male or female, because it is important to be able to de determine that to establish the age of death of an adolescent individual. Um, if we look at, and this is to show again the different stages of fusion. If we look at the ribs, so we've just an example of a, of a right rib here, and what we're looking at is these joint surfaces. There's, it's difficult to pick up, but there's no fusion in that. That's still a youthful, unfused surface. Whereas if we look at this bone in particular, again, there's no fusion there, but you'll see it, hopefully a tiny flake of bone is just appearing there, and that's the joint surface beginning to form and fuse in this individual. When we look at the spine, and this is one element of the lower spine, very like an adult individual, as you can see, it's full, full size. Um, but the difference here is that this is immature. You'll just be able to hopefully pick up the, the kind of striations that are visible here during, um, from about 17 years of age up until about 25, there'll be a, the development of the ossification of a ring around this part of the vertebra that will eventually fuse on. And um, that's the, the state, state of fusion of, that's the completion of maturation of the, the vertebra. Um, two of the elements that we would use most for right into very early adulthood, because they're the joints that are the last to fuse in the body. And it would be here in the sacrum, which again is the lower part of the spine, the triangular piece of bone in the pelvis. And it is, so this is the first one, the first sacral vertebra, and this is the body of the second one, it's incomplete, but these haven't fused on yet. And that joint there, that surface there, is one of the last in the human skeleton to fuse. It'll eventually fuse on in, you know, by about 25 years of age. And in the collarbone, I think we mentioned this uh, later as well, that this part, which is what we call the medial end or the par part of the collarbone that's nearest the central part of the body. So this is the last element in the human skeleton to fuse on. And this will have fused on in, in everybody by the age of 30 years of age. If it's not, if it's still in the process of fusion, and everything else in the body is fused, we know that that individual is probably 25 to 30 years of age. So that can be a very good indicator of age of death. And then finally, if we look at part of the pelvis of an individual at this age, you can see certain elements that we'll be discussing later on in terms of adults and what, how we determine the, the sex of an individual is in particular. But we know from certain aspects of this pelvis that it is from a, a male individual. But what's important to 
look at here in comparison to what I'll show you later on is again you'll be familiar now with how unfused surfaces look and how youthful surfaces look but this part which we will show later is the auricular ilium that we're used to determine the age of death in, in adult individuals is very youthful in this individual it's smooth it's soft there's it's it's called billowing in that particular instance and unfortunately this part here is incomplete but there's traces again of, of billowing there that would suggest a very young um, you know a young individual an adolescence obviously the other final thing here to note is we referenced it earlier the secondary epiphyses that fuse onto the the skeleton and you'll notice all around the edge of the pelvis here again is that roughened unfused surface and as an individual goes through adolescence and into early adulthood, a crest of bone will develop here and eventually fuse on. You can see here, you can actually see the line of fusion of this part of the pelvis. Okay, so you can see it very clearly there. That will extend right up here eventually and it'll all fuse on to, to be a single piece of bone. And again, these, they're extensive uh, research has gone into the rates of fusion of these elements um, they, and you know the, as I said the reading list provides the references that we use this can be extremely useful in, in, in cases of disarticulated remains again that are all <clears throat> mixed up because we know there's different rates of fusion so if you're getting um, you can be even though they may all be similar size you might be able to trace different timings in terms of fusion and that might establish that uh, you know how many individuals are represented so we're going to move on now to adult individuals and how we determine the age of death and the sex of individuals of adult individuals so now we're going to look at how we determine the age of death of adult individuals we've already gone through in detail uh, juvenile individuals all the way up to uh, about 17 or 18 years of age so what we have here is the remains of the individual we had initially on the table, which is the, uh, an adult, obviously, and for comparison, uh, some important comparative elements of another adult individual. Um, as, as we know already, the age at death of adults is more difficult to determine than juveniles. And this is because by adulthood, the skeleton has stopped growing, it has stopped developing, it is essentially mature. And so what we're looking at in the skeleton is how it is literally degenerating. And particularly this relates to joints, various joints within the pelvic region in particular, um, and how these progressively get worse. So it is a lot more uh, uh, variable um, because the changes are influenced by, for example, whether it is a female or a male individual, because obviously the pelvis functions differently in females and males, particularly relating to birth. Um, but it also relates to work practices. If somebody is involved in uh, heavy labor in particular, um, that involves a lot of muscle use, this can impact on all aspects of the skeleton, obviously, but it can actually impact on some of the joints that we would typically use to determine the age at death. Um, in, in general, you know, the most obvious indicator at first would be the size of an individual. You've seen the size of juveniles, how, how you know, how small, I suppose, um, in particular infant remains can be. Um, but when you get an individual like this, you you know, even an amateur can pretty much assume that this is an adult individual. Um, and how we determine the age of death of this of an individual very much depends on the preservation. And the preservation and the context is, is key in, in, the, in this regards. If you have the complete remains of a skeleton that are well preserved, then theoretically it's much more easy to tell uh, you know, to determine approximately at least what age they were when they died. You could have 
the complete remains of the skeleton that are very, very poorly preserved. Perhaps all you have is the mid shafts of bones preserved. The entire torso could be, uh, you know, very fragmentary um, and literally surviving as, as, as very small pieces of bone. The pelvis in particular, bones that are comprised of uh, calcinous bone, spongy bone, will be some of the first that will degenerate in the soil. Whereas the strong, robust bones, such as your thigh bone, your femur, which is one of the strongest bones in the body, that will generally preserve quite well. The pelvis, you can see here, even though this, the remains of this individual are well preserved, the pelvis has suffered from damage. It is fragmented. You can see there is damage to, to various elements of it. So even, you know, this, this can be a problem, um, that the, the bone... The elements that we use most for determining the age of death and sex of adult individuals is one of the elements that uh, can have the poorest level of preservation. Um, some, there are techniques that have been uh, used in the past that we would not recommend as much nowadays because, simply because they're not as reliable in determining the age of death. Um, and I just want to mention, as I, as I already said, that it is more difficult to determine the age of death of adult individuals. And we've already seen in juveniles, the age groups are quite small or are, they're tight, like infants are less than a year old, young juveniles are one to six years of age and on and on. Whereas when you get to adulthood, we literally only have three categories in osteoarchaeology. So we have the young adult, which is approximately 17, 18 years of age to 25. We have a middle adult, which is 25 years to 30, to, excuse me, 25 years to 45 years. And from 45 years onwards, it is considered an old adult. It is almost impossible to be specific in terms of how old somebody was, was when they died once they get over that age, because there's so many variables to take into account. There are other techniques that can be applied, um, histology and, and can be used, but these are not routinely used in archaeological remains, particularly because of expenses involved, obviously, but as well because of the nature of archaeological remains, there we have to be very careful um, ethically not to be destroying human remains um, without a very, very good purpose. Uh, behind that destruction. So most archaeological remains are, are the osteological profiling is determined morphologically by looking at the bones rather than looking at, at um, microscopically. So if we look at the skull, and these are, I'm just referring here to maybe some of the techniques that are not used as much. And you'll see in the skull of this individual and we've already seen in the, in the juveniles how the skull is in different plates. And you can see here the knotted suture lines, which is a form of a jo joint in the head. Um, these eventually, as, as an individual ages, these knot tighter and tighter together, and eventually they will fuse completely and they will obliterate. So the skull will literally be one complete bone. Um, as I said, in the, in the very small infants, you've seen that the skull is in dip, completely separate plates. This has been used in the past to determine the age of death, but it is very variable because certain parts of the skull fuse before other parts. So if you have a fragmentary skull, you know, just because you've fusion doesn't mean the entire skull was, the sutures were obliterated. And there are also pathological uh, conditions that can cause premature fusion in some sutures. So it's not recommended to, in general to use that technique of cranial suture closure in determining the age of death. Um, unless, you know, it, it can be a backup, certainly, if there's other evidence showing that it's a very old individual. This will just be maybe a confirmation if there's no evidence of suture lines. Alternatively, it can be useful in if you have an assemblage that is what we call disarticulated. So burials as such, the burial of an individual in a single grave 
We refer to that as being an articulated burial because all the bones are in anatomical position. But in some circumstances, in, in pre, a lot of prehistoric burials and certainly in uh, you know, other practices like in the medieval period when there was the, the deliberate, um, and more recently, sorry, there, there may be the collection of bones from older burials for deposition in, in, in a charnel house or something in a, in a church environment. Um, or in forensic cases where the bones are disarticulated and there may be the remains of multiple individuals all mixed in together. Um, things like this, if, the, if you find a skull that has absolutely no sutures, that is very visibly a much older individual, but you have clear evidence then of a juvenile, for example, that can be an indicator of you know, multiple individuals within that assemblage. But what we, and sorry, I've spoken already and we've shown um, a slightly, you know, somebody that's in their teenage years, we've already seen what we would use up until, you know, the age of 25 really in, in some individuals, this is a completely mature individual, but what we'd call the fusion of the secondary um, uh, epiphysis within the individual. And if you'll remember the what I was speaking about, the medial end of the clavicle or the collarbone, that is one of the last bones in the body to completely mature. Um, and as well, the spine, we've already seen how that um, appears to be in, an, in, in an, a, an adolescent individual. But once, essentially once you reach the age of 25, from 25 onwards, what we would use to determine the age of death in particular would be the pelvis. Um, and the two joints that we would use would be the auricular ilium. So we're just going to look at the model of the skeleton again. The auricular ilium is the joints back here. And it's where at the base of the spine, where the sacrum is, that triangular bone at the base of the spine, where it joins onto the pelvis on the left and right side. So this joint, a left and a right side, and as well, what we'd use is the pubic symphysis, which is the joint at the front of the pelvis, where, where the two pubic bones join at the front of the pelvis. The pelvic, the pubic symphysis is by far the bone that is the most reliable in terms of determining both the age of death and the sex of the individual. Unfortunately, the location of the bone within the skeleton is the problem. If, if we go back to the individual on the table and you imagine an individual buried in the grave, similar to this, the pelvis that's lying out here, as you can see, this is the pubic symphysis bone. And you can see how much it sits up from the rest, from what may be considered the, the base of the grave. This bone, as I mentioned earlier, is part of the pelvis, it's part of a spongy bone that really doesn't preserve that well quite often. And it is also because it sits so high, it is very often inadvertently either truncated by later activity or by inadvertently by the person actually excavating the, the grave itself. It's unfortunately easily done and it is a very fragile bone, but it is, a, you know, it's a really good, um, can be a really good indicator of age of death. But if we look first at the auricular ilium, and we're looking at it in the pelvic bone itself. We're not looking at the joint within the sacrum, which is the triangular bone at the base of the spine. We look at the surface on the left and right side of the pelvis, which is the ilium, and we're looking at the joint surface here. And I've made reference already to the techniques that are used to look at this and to establish the age at death of the individual. This individual is in their late 30s based on both this and the pubic symphysis. Now, if we look here, this is a, another individual that you'll see is well preserved as well. And again, that's the auricular ilium on the left and the right side of that individual. And by looking at these, comparing them to the, the, the published methods and seeing the morphological differences 
that's how the age of death of, of that individual is determined. And in this one in particular, the surface is quite smooth. I, there is some post-mortem damage and it is important to be able to identify what is post-mortem damage, what is pathological damage, um, and what is part of the, the actual uh, aging process itself. In this case, this is post-mortem damage, but the surface of that joint itself is quite smooth. There is no billowing, like we've seen earlier in the juvenile individuals. Um, and so th th this, this is quite a good, clear indicator of how old this individual is. Um, as I said, though, it is the pubic symphysis, which is the, really the one that is more reliable than uh, that particular element. And again, we have seen in the, ju the juvenile individuals how a very youthful uh, pubic symphysis looks. It has that classic billowing appearance. There is no definition to, to the outline of it. So I'll, just, I'll show you this one because it's slightly better preserved. And it's this flat surface here. And you'll see that there's a very clear edge all around this this surface and that's that's at the very least showing the maturity of the individual I, again referencing back to the billowing in a younger one um, and the flattening of the surface um, when that is well preserved it, it, it really is one of the best um, indicators um, so that uh, the other thing I should mention is that in terms of techniques that are sometimes uh, suggested for determining the age of death and which again we would not generally recommend. Uh, some would recommend using dental attrition or dental wear. Now in, in the presentation on pathological lesions you'll see some um, excessive dental wear. The problem and the, the, the methodology is based on the fact that once an individual has their complete permanent dentition Theoretically, because, uh, because of the diet that's being consumed, the surface of the teeth should become more worn as an individual ages. And this is certainly true for prehistoric populations or populations where um, a diet may be very coarse. And it, you know, there's some um, societies even today that ha their diet is quite coarse. But we're, our diet in general, um, would be considered soft and processed and our teeth don't wear down and it in 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 ireland it is particularly related to how um, food processing has changed over the centuries so that yes if we get a medieval skeleton or early medieval skeleton or a prehistoric skeleton where there is excessive tooth wear then you could certainly suggest that that might be an older individual. And I, I'm suggesting that in the case of perhaps you have a burial where only the teeth are preserved. Um, whereas if you come into from literally the, the 16th century onwards in Ireland, you cannot use that, that, method, that technique of determining the age of death because the technologies in terms of food production completely change and that's when our food becomes more processed and less coarse as such, uh, but I'll be going into more detail on those changes. So we would again not, not recommend necessarily um, basing uh, age at death on tooth wear. There's always the factor to consider as well that uh, people are individuals. Some people literally may not have consumed the coarse diet that might have been the preference of the, the wider community for whatever reason. So there's also the, you know, the individual factor to take into account. So now we're going to move on to determining how, to showing how we determine. We're going to look now at how we determine the sex of an adult individual. As we said earlier, it's not possible to determine just from looking at the bones, the sex of juvenile individuals because the morphological changes aren't as clear in juvenile remains. Um, they can be quite distinct in adult individuals, but there will always be individuals who do not fall into a very 
male category or a very female category. And we're referring here to biological sex. This is, this is not about gender. It's the biological sex of, of the skeletal remains itself themselves. Um, the first technique that w I'm going to refer to, but is, is not the most reliable again, would be uh, metrical analysis. And they, this is literally by measuring various bones and, and um, looking at how they, they relate to each other. There are standards, like all the techniques of determining the age of death and the sex of individuals, the techniques in terms of metrics has been established from looking at populations where either the age of death and the sex of the individual is already known or it's clear from other aspects. Um, <clears throat> metrical analysis is very much dependent on the population itself being examined. So you can have a population in one part of a country who, you know, have quite large males and quite small females. You could have a contemporary population living relatively close by that there are less differences in terms of metrics, in terms of size of individuals between males and females. So we have to be very careful in terms of how this is applied to archaeological remains. And obviously it's used again in, in forensics as well. Some of the ones that are most typically used would be the things like the diameter of the head of the femur or the thigh bone, um, the size of, of, of this, looking at the size of the distal end of the femur down here, the tibia, again, you're looking at the width here at the top of the bone. Um, and there are other techniques have been developed in forensics in particular of looking of individual bones, um, the, of trying to determine uh, the, the sex from those, but they are not routinely used again in, in uh, archaeological remains. And look, moving to the top of the skeleton, we, uh, the others that would be used a lot would be the head of the humerus here, of the arm, and the morphology and the size of this joint surface of the humerus as well, as well as parts of the scapula or the shoulder blade. Um, but again, this technique of metrical analysis should be used in conjunction with other um, information from skeletal remains. So we're going to look in particular at the skull and the pelvis. Again, not surprisingly, it is the pelvis that can show the most variation between females and males related specifically to birthing and how the pelvis differs between the male and the female individual. But if we look at the skull first, and we're going to show um, a male skull in particular, and so this is the, the cranium, and again, you'd be very careful of how to, to pick up a human skull. You would never pick it up by putting, you know, your fingers in the eye sockets, that it needs to use two hands um, and hold it very steadily. So what I have here is the skull of a male individual. The skull on the white sheet here, and we've used the white sheet to distinguish bones that are actually not belong to this main skeleton. Um, that skull and the pelvis next to it are from a female individual. So I'm going to show the, some of the elements that distinguish this individual as being male in particular. And if you look especially over the eye sockets, and it's best looking at it from the side, because the front, it may not seem as obvious, but over here in particular, you'll see there's a ridge above the eye sockets. That tends to be quite prominent in male individuals. And as well, the, skull, the frontal bone of the forehead tends to slope backwards in a male. This part here, which is called the mastoid process, is part of the temporal bone of the skull, of the the side of the skull, which is basically where your ear is. You can actually feel this bone behind your ear. There's a lump of bone behind your ear that you can actually feel. In males, this will tend to be quite large, and uh, such is the case here. What may also be apparent is that, if you see here, this is actually the cheekbone. Now, it's incomplete, and this is the nature again of, of skeletal remains. There's generally an arch that extends from the cheekbone back here. 
to what's what's called the external auditory meatus. But this arch can be very prominent in male individuals as well. And th it's important to know these aspects because sometimes you're dealing with fragmentary remains. And then at the back of the skull, so this is the back of the skull, you'll see here, and it it's, tends to be maybe one of the least obvious ones, but males will often have a ridge, a palpable ridge of bone here. And this is to do with muscle mass. A lot of the, the general robusticity in male individuals has to do with the fact that males in general will have greater muscle mass and the bones are adapted for that purpose. So there will very often be an actual ridge of bone here. The skull will generally be larger um, and more, more robust overall. There'll also be changes here, but it's, it's obviously difficult to show them in this context, but the, the actual tops of the eye sockets as well. In, fe in males, it tends to be quite rounded, and in females, it's a much sharper edge here. So all of those aspects can be quite um, useful in determining the sex of the individual. So I'm going to show you the female skull. And this is, inst you can see how this is smaller than the other individual. But if we look again at the forehead of this individual, there, it's not, there's no prominent brow ridge. There is a little bit, but it's not very prominent. And the forehead in this individual, in females, tends to be quite straight down. In males, as I said, it slopes back a little bit more. And the ridge above the eye sockets, again, tends to be quite sharp in, in the females. You can see here, this is the mastoid process in this individual, and it's very small in comparison to what we saw in the male. And this, again, is a more, slightly more complete uh, arch of bone here. This is the element I was speaking of that can be very prominent in male individuals. Here, it's much more subtle. And when we look at the back of the skull, you'll see that it's much smoother here. There isn't that, that ridge of bone that is present in the male individual. So they would be the, the, some of the defining characteristics in, in the skull itself. But there's also differences in the, the mandible. Um, <clears throat> if we look again at the male mandible, so here we have it here. In general, and if I just show it next to this individual, you'll see it's, again, larger. But what you'll tend to see is that the front here, the, what's called the mental eminence, will be quite prominent. It's not as prominent here, but the jaw can be quite squared here. And if you look back to the female, you can see it's quite rounded. Okay? Very rounded in that individual. And here, it's not, and this is, again, why you have to take an overall picture in terms of um, determining the age of death because, sorry, sorry, the sex of the individual. You have to look at the overall skeleton because in this case, this is not a particularly male jaw here. Some males will have a very flared, uh, what's called gonial angle here at the back of the, the jaw. Again, you can actually feel it in your own jaw. It's not as prominent here. So I'm just going to put this back again and look at the female. And if you look at her jaw, it's again much more slight, but she, has, she doesn't have that flair either. So they would be, again, in, in the skull, in the cranium, in the mandible, the main elements that we would use. But as with the, the determining the age of death, it is the pelvis that is the best indicator of the sex of the individual. Now, you know, again, the, the remains here are slightly incomplete, but this is the nature of human remains that we get on archaeological sites, on forensic sites, is that they can be incomplete. So, you know, you, you need to, to, to deal with remains that, that are in that state. But as I said, it is particularly relating to uh, the birthing process that is why the female pelvis and the male pelvis are quite different. In general, the female pelvis will be, can, tends to be smaller in size, but it's various angles within it that tend to be broader. Um, and so if we're looking 
in terms of the angles we're looking in particular here again at the pubis in the front and it is this angle down here and this during birth this actually separates a little bit so in skeletal remains it is quite narrow in the male individual whereas it's much broader in females so if you take this and this is the the right hand side of the male pelvis again as i said it's incomplete but we've already shown in the looking at the age of death that this is the pubic symphysis so there, it'll be mirrored on the other side by the same element here so the left and right sides but it's this angle that we're looking at so just simply if i place my finger against it here you can see the angle that is formed it's approximately a you know it's well it's less than 45 degrees if you again look at the incomplete left hand side here and you put it against it you can get some indication of the angle that is formed here at the front okay which is quite narrow if you look at it in the female pelvis and this is slightly better preserved so this is the left hand side of a female again the pubic symphysis here it would be mirrored by the right hand side of the pelvis and if you look at the angle here again if i put my finger against it here you'll see it's significantly broader much much broader than in the male individual okay and this is one of the best indicators again at the age of the sex of the individual it's it's simply that during birth there is more room for the for the fetus to to emerge again it's difficult to show in these conditions but things like this ridge of bone coming down here this will be curved outwards in a female individual again allowing you know greater room in the within the pelvis and there will be differences in shapes here in this part of the bone the other angle that would be used quite a lot in determining the, the sex of the individual would be the sciatic notch. I, I should mention again if, that unfortunately this is the part of the bone that is tends to be most poorly preserved in the skeleton, in the pelvis. So that is unfortunate in terms of determining the sex. But the other angle that would be used quite a lot is this in here which is the sciatic notch. Okay? Um, and if we just keep the right the right one of the female there so this is a, a rule of thumb that is used by a lot, a lot of osteoarchaeologists if you hold two fingers like that you'll see the angle is quite similar here and here okay so it's it's relatively narrow whereas if you look at it in a female individual it's much broader it's more similar to an angle formed by your hand like that so that can be a very strong indicator again of the sex of the individual. As I said, you'll always get instances where it's not as clear whether it is a male or female and you have to do an overall assessment then in terms of trying to determine that. And it may not always be possible. There are other uh, factors that we would use. There's a, a, a sulcus here, which is a, a groove that can be a, an indicator of sex and quite rightly in, in you know quite aptly possibly in both of these individuals it's actually not prominent in this female which it would be expected to be prominent whereas it's a little bit clearer a little bit clearer in this individual it's just this piece of bone coming down here um, another thing that we would use um, again in the pubis is the ventral arc and these are all detailed in in the presentation on um, the sex of the individual and it, it, you know showing you in a little bit more detail and referencing the 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 techniques that are used but the ventral arc is here at the very front of the pubis i'm sure you you, you can't actually probably see anything there um, because it's not actually present because it's a male individual okay so that's the pubic symphysis there is no, there isn't a prominent ventral arc. In your female individual, you can see here, again, this is the pubic symphysis. There's actually a ridge coming down here. And that is your, your ventral arc, 
much a more common feature in female individuals. Um, they would be the main techniques in terms of determining the age of death or the sex of the individual and as I said the age of death as well. Um, but it's in, in both regards of the, the profiling of the skeletal remains, it's about assessing all of the remains you have um, in as much detail as possible and determining using all the techniques available. Obviously you're limited if the skeletal remains are incomplete or if the preservation is poor, um, which obviously is, is, <coughs> is problematic in its own right. Um, so the other th th aspect of profiling that we've mentioned in, in, the, uh, in the presentation would be ancestry. Um, that is, it's a very specialised technique um, of looking at skeletal remains that is used predominantly in forensic um, anthropology. It wouldn't be commonly used in archaeological remains um, at all. So I'm not going to cover it here. It's, 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 and there is, you know, there's a certain degree of controversy attached to it as well. Um, and with the other aspect that we refer to in the profiling is, is determining the stature of the individual. And that would be established uh, using, again, uh, equations that, regression equations that have been established from known populations, literally people, uh, you know, cadavers where that have been studied, where the age of death and the sex of the individual is known, and, so, and their stature. And so they've, you know, the researchers have looked at the lengths of long bones and have established uh, equations of how you can estimate the height of an individual. And we would generally use the bones of the leg for the estimation of the stature, uh, the, the femur, the thigh bone, and the shin bone, or the tibia, excuse me, um, and because these are considered the most reliable um, in determining the stature of an indiv individual. The bones of the arm are less reliable, but, you know, it again depends on what, what survives of the skeletal remains. Um, so we're going to leave it there in terms of determining the, the profiling of osteoarchaeological osteo remains, um, and we're going to look at, uh, in another session, dental um, looking at dental analysis and diseases and conditions that show up and also looking at some skeletal pathological lesions in particular to do with um, various traumas. <laughs>